The Pedal Shift Project is sponsored by Hawbuck Dyneema Wallets. Leave the bulk at home and keep just the cash and cards you need in the super thin, ultra light wallet I carry on bike tours. Go to hawbuck.camp and get 10% off with offer code PEDALSHIFT. Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 161, and you can email the show pedalshift at pedalshift.net, or call the voicemail hotline 202-930-1109, and check Pedalshift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 161st edition of the Pedal Shift Project. I'm Tim Mooney. We've got a really cool show today talking all about stealth camping on bicycle tour. But before we get to all of that, we've got some news and housekeeping. We've got some five-star reviews. We've got some other kind of stuff uh, to lead off the show with. So why don't we just kick that right off? Uh, first up, uh, I wanted to mention that May 8th is the Rails to Trails Conservancy's kind of unveiling of this Great American Rail Trail route. Now, I'm going to be in the middle of a route myself, of a tour, uh, so I'm hoping to be able to check it all out. They're going to be streaming this stuff live on their website and on their Facebook page. I've got the note that they emailed out to a bunch of folks uh, over on in the show notes. That's pedalshift.net slash 161, but you can uh, check it all out on their website. I think that's rails to trails.org if I'm not mistaken. But anyways, links are all in the show notes there. Um, they are kicking out all the stops are doing it on all the socials as well so you can find out what's going on I, i'm interested in seeing what they're doing to connect these gateway trails i i think that to me is the big value add that they're going to be doing now the question will be what what have they done to vet those connections are they working with aca or how, how are they doing this because as somebody who is trying to connect a few at least two trails two gateway trails of theirs uh well actually no that's not true <laughs> i take it back the uh the great allegheny passage is not technically one of the trails on uh the route it it may be well, come may 8th but i guess we'll have to see but i'm connecting of course as you all know the uh great Allegheny Passage with the Ohio to Erie Trail, but I'm doing some road routes on that. Their route will be a little bit further to the south because they're including the Panhandle Trail. So however they're doing it, it's almost assuredly going to include the Great Allegheny Passage. It's almost assuredly going to go south of where I'm going. The question ends up being, are they going to somehow route up all the way to Cleveland, or are they just going to kind of get to the Ohio to Erie Trail as quickly as possible. All of these things will be potentially answered on May 8th, so check out that come May 8th. I mentioned this a lot on the show. Whenever you do a review, and not just you know, click on the five stars themselves, but actually write an actual review, usually on Apple Podcasts, but really any place, that helps get other people to uh, hear the show. It, it's the dark magic in Cupertino, the algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. So I always like to acknowledge the folks that give five-star reviews and read them out on the show. Uh, this one comes from Apple Podcasts Canada. That was on April 1st. Hopefully not an April Fool's joke against me. This was from Geocaching Media. Misha and geocaching Misha says top notch. I am motivated to tour. Thank you. I have been listening with that happy feeling. I own the gear, a 1990 Cannondale T1000 Burley trailer. I have toured, including the coast of Maine and numerous tours in the maritime provinces, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island and Vermont. Now I am planning tours. Yay. Great to be motivated to do more than swimming, biking, and running. <laughs> That's all? Just swimming, biking, and running? <laughs> Sorry, I broke into that there with a little commentary. As a plus, loaded touring is great practice for racing. Big smiling face from Geocaching Misha. Thank you, Misha, for that five-star review. And as we all know, whenever the Pedal Ship Project gets a five-star review, an angel gets her wings. I got an email from not Misha, but Miha, and I, Miha, I'm, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. As we all know, I am incapable of pronouncing things in Slovenia, as will be evidenced when I try once again to pronounce the capital city from which you are from when I read your email here. Miha says, I've subscribed to the Pedal Ship Project podcast 
quite some time ago and listened to my first episode of it. And what a surprise that the Pedal Shift Project podcast is the most popular in my country. Ha! However, just some time ago is not anymore. Yes, we covered that. <laughs> I don't know what is the algorithm and source data behind podcast ranking, but it's never less funny. I agree. Uh, but it was fun to be number one. Anyway, in terms of cycling, one can find all kinds of terrain in Slovenia, from plains to hills and mountains. And although the country is small, tiny in fact, there is plenty of things to do so that the around-the-country trip can easily extend from a week or two to more than a month of adventure. Welcome. All the best from Jublana, Slovenia. I think I said that right. Uh, Miha, Miha, thank you for writing, and thank you, Slovenia, for one brief shining moment <laughs> for making the Pedal Shift Project your favorite and top outdoor podcast. It, I'm, I'm hoping to cycle there someday. Miha sent amazing beautiful pictures. It is a gorgeous country. If you are in Europe and you are looking at Slovenia as a potential, uh, let me tell you, the pictures alone do it justice. Go check it out. Before we uh, get into the stealth camping talk, I wanted to mention one little thing about Pedal Shift Society. There is a bonus exclusive podcast feed for all members of the Pedal Shift Society, regardless of level. If you're an active member, I've sent out the email. If you are a member of the Pedal Shift Society and didn't get an email from me with the details, shoot me an email directly at pedalshift at pedalshift.net. It may be because the email that you use for uh, the subscription or for the one shot, your PayPal email, whatever you used isn't the one you check all the time. So if you're missing it, can't find it, shoot me an email and I will let you know the the feed. The cool thing about this is that it's the it's going to be basically the feed that stores all of my audio for the tour and even a few things beforehand. The feed right now actually has a little bit of a shakedown ride, which I did on the CNO recently. I'll probably be uploading another one perhaps as early as tomorrow or today. Actually, today. I'm recording this on Wednesday, you can tell. <laughs> I'm planning on going out on a morning ride on the Thursday, which is the same day that this very podcast gets launched. So it's possible you might get a bonus podcast out of all of this as well. So Pedal Shift Society, folks, uh, you hopefully have that email. If you don't, if you can't find it, shoot me an email, pedalshift at pedalshift.net. There will be a lot more content coming uh, when the DC to Cincinnati tour kicks off in May. Can you tell I'm excited? All right, next up on the show is the lab. The lab is the part of the show when we talk about experimental things or things we're trying for our bicycle tours, uh, things that we maybe are a little bit, oh, I don't know, not, um, not, not as practiced in or not as comfortable with. We do experiments and we try and keep things and we dispense of the things that don't work so well. So on this episode, we're going to be talking all about stealth camping, because I know for many of you who are bicycle tourists who do camping, stealth camping is the one thing that maybe you're feeling the most reticent, the least likely to tackle. And so I thought that I would spend an entire episode talking about it because I think that it has a great place within bicycle touring for many people. And if you can get over maybe your predispositions on it or your worries about it, that it might be something that you may want to try as part of your bicycle touring. Stealth camping is not for everyone. And I think that will, by just having a longer discussion about it, you'll find out whether it's for you. Um, I'm going to start off by saying in the opening note here, I am not a super experienced stealth camper. I tend to stay the nights in designated campsites, whether they're free or paid. But I have done a little bit, and I have some in my future, and I thought I'd share with you what I know. There are folks who are in the listening audience that are probably almost exclusively stealth campers and probably have a lot to share. If you are thinking that there's something more to share out there, shoot me a line and we will cover it in a future show. Always happy to hear from listeners with more experience on any topic that I cover. So please email or call with your thoughts. Of course, the voicemail hotline is a good place for that. I don't stealth camp often because I generally don't have to. Um, the routes that I pick, the places that I go, it, it, there tends to be good camping that is either cheap or free, and that fits my needs. When I do have to or choose to stealth camp, I tread very lightly. I follow the absolute rock solid principles of leave no trace. I get in and I get out quickly 
and I respect places that are explicitly forbidden. So that's my take. There are other philosophies around stealth camping, and I don't quibble with any of them, except for the absolute rule of leave no trace. If you go into a place that is not strictly a campsite and you're leaving your junk all over the place, I, I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. That's that's the one time that I kind of get off of my everybody gets to ride their own ride kind of a thing. I think that that's an absolute rule for anybody who's doing any camping and bicycle touring. If you don't agree with that, this is not the show for you, but I expect most of you probably agree with that. So let's go back to what my definition of stealth camping is, because there's a lot of things out there. There's a lot of folks who, who talk about wild camping, blah, 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 lots of different words for it. I choose stealth for a reason. My definition is that you are sleeping or resting overnight, you are leaving zero impact slash leave no trace, and you are trying to make this as not illegal as you can make it because you are, this is the most overreaching definition here, you are staying someplace that is not, strictly speaking, a campsite, okay? So you're resting overnight in a place that's not strictly a campsite, you leave no trace, And you try to make your stay as not illegal as possible. And for those of you who have ever heard me talk about stealth camping, I use I choose those words specifically because, as we'll talk about in a little bit here, for the most part, strictly speaking, a lot of stealth camping is technically illegal. It's technically trespassing. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Goals. Your goals when you are stealth camping. Number one, and this is probably the most important one, no visibility. Make sure that you are not able to be seen from any vantage point, any place. I mean, I suppose if somebody's got a drone and is flying overhead or there are police helicopters going over you, okay, maybe you might be able, maybe, maybe you're not going to be completely like, you know, SEAL Team 6 invisible, but you're trying to reduce your visibility as much as possible. The second uh, goal is that you are easily getting in and easily getting out of where you're at. Sometimes that goal isn't necessarily hit because you're trying to stay as invisible as possible or you're trying to stay in a place that is as away from folks as possible. But easy in, easy out. Maybe it's quickly in, quickly out is probably a better way of looking at that. The third goal that I have, again, these are all sort of my points of view on this, sleeping only with some exceptions. I don't think that I have ever done anything in any stealth camping situation, and I've run through them all in my head. I've never done any cooking. I've never done any fires. I've never done anything like that. For many people, when they are stealth camping, that is an absolute bright line rule. No fires, no nothing. Um, And that's part of their leave no trace thing. It's how how I happen to roll. I know that there are folks out there that have no problems doing stealth camping and bringing along a stove and doing cooking and all of that other kind of stuff. Um, For me, the only exception I would make to the only sleeping rule would be if I'm doing this because of a safety issue. I'm doing it because... Uh, there's bad weather coming and I need to get off of the road because it's going to be unsafe to be staying there. That would be probably the only time that I would do that. And frankly, that would be only after I've exhausted all possibilities of finding a place where I actually have permission to go. Okay. So anyways, sleeping only is a goal. And fourth, very early exit, do not return. And that one is sort of the way that sort of completes your time at that spot You're going to leave absolutely no trace when you look back on your spot as you are pushing your bike or or hopefully maybe even pedaling your bike away from the exact spot. You look back and you don't see any signs that you were there. The reason why for a very early exit is because you're only there for sleeping. You're not there for hanging out. You're not there for drinking a cup of coffee in the morning. You're getting out and you don't return because you're continuing on your trail. You're not coming back for additional nights, even if it's a really great spot. Do not return. Use it once only. So those are the four goals. Tools. This is where kind of the idea for this kind of came up for me is because I have recently done a a revision to one very important element of my kit, and that's going to help me be able to pull off stealth camping a little bit better. So let's talk a little bit about tools. So the first of the tools is it's kind of a global thing. You have minimal setup and you have a minimal pack up in the morning. Why is that? Well, the idea here is that you're going to be getting there kind of as late as possible. 
when I'm ever considering a stealth camping situation, I will Google, if it's possible, and it always has been, what time sunset is for that area, if I don't already know it. I mean, if I've been going for a little while, I, I generally have a good sense of when the sun is going to go down within at least a couple of minutes. And the reason is, is that it's right around then that you're going to try to get off the road in an unseen way, go to wherever your spot is, and start setting up. Because all you're going to do is get set up as quickly as possible, right as it's about to get dark. And then you're going to want a minimal setup because you're not going to have a ton of time in the light conditions that you're going to have. So minimal setup. You're not going to pull out all your stuff. This is not a great time to try to hang up a line and dry things. You want to make it so it's essentially just your hammock, just your tent, whatever you're going to be using. And that's all you're going to have to take down the next morning when you're packing up to go. So that's a really important thing right there. So planning ahead and knowing what you're going to be doing and knowing how to set up your shelter in a way that you can do with minimal or no light is a really, really good idea. Second thing kind of goes hand in hand with that. Avoid using lights or use a muffled light or use, a, if, for those of you who have a setting on your headlamp, go with either red or green because that will be much less visible from further away. Red's probably the one you want to use, although I've, I've read and seen a lot of people use their green. I don't happen to have a headlamp that has that setting, but um, I have an old, uh, what do you call them? Uh, not a reflector, but uh, well, I, I guess it's the reflector. There was a car, there was a car accident in my neighborhood and there was a whole bunch of red shards from the, um, from the taillights that got all busted up and it was going to end up getting swept up and gone into the trash anyways. So I grabbed one and I shaped it so that I can put that over my headlamp and kind of just tie it up or rubber band it on there. And that is that works really well for me. So I don't have to replace my headlamp and or otherwise get a second one. I can use the same old tried and true Petzl that I've had for God knows how long. Uh, but that is really helpful. So if I do need a little bit of light, I've got it on hand so I'm not using my big white bright light while I get the tent together or the hammock together. You'll want to cover up your bike and any brightly colored gear that you've got. Your bike is probably the most important thing because bikes are just covered in reflective stuff. Any kind of light, and that's by design. We want that. We want that for safety. But the sidewalls on my tires are super reflective. I've got reflectors on my wheels in the spokes. I've got reflectors on the back and on the front. You know, they are meant to be seen when light is shown upon it. So you're probably going to want to have some way to cover it up. Now, some of you will have a tent where you'll have a big enough vestibule that you can kind of stash the bike under on the ground. Some of you may want to bring an additional tarp. Or you might be able to just even use some brush that's around. A lot of it's going to be dependent on where you're at. But uh, I, I tend to uh, go to places where I'm far enough off the road that it's not as big of a deal. But you just never know because stealth camping is one of those things that usually you don't know where you're going to be stealth camping. and You're going to take what you can get based on where you're at. Ideally, you want a blending colored hammock or tent fly for your shelter, whichever one you're using. Um, I've got a very green, very easily blendable hammock that works really great. Problem is, is that I don't, it doesn't have an integrated rain fly. I sold my Hennessy hammock years ago and you know, that one, that one was really great for the stealth camping because it was perfectly colored for that. My tent very famously is orange. Well, was orange because I decided to experiment for this trip with seeing if I could figure out a way to replace that fly with something that was green or brown or something different. And as it turned out, there was no kind of replacement fly that was available that I could figure out for that tent. So I did a little bit of research and it turns out that it is possible to spray paint your rain fly. Now, there are massive downsides to that, and I'm not even going to get into all the downsides or upsides of it, but I did it, I tried it, and frankly, it seems to work pretty well. Um, the tent is much, much, much lower profile now, and I did a little bit of waterproofing over it. The fabric is now, of course, a little bit heavier because I've added some weight to it with the paint. Um, but it is also waterproof because I also added a waterproof layer over the top of it. 
I'm going to be seam sealing it as well, just to make double sure about it. I don't think that this is a permanent thing. I'm sure this is going to flake off over time, uh, especially with the crumpling and uncrumpling and maybe when it gets wet and et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think it's a worthy experiment to see if uh, this ends up working out. The reason why I decided to take the risk with this, I guess risk, put that in small quotes, is because my tent served me really, really well over the years. And I, if 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 it's getting to the point where it's about ready to be replaced, I can easily replace it. And if it turns out that this is just not a good idea, well, I can at least replace it with the same type of tent or maybe get a different tent. It all depends. I don't do a lot of stealth camping, to be honest. And so the orange fly has been fine for me. I mean, I have essentially a mountaineering or a, a backcountry uh, hiking back uh, type of tent that is... Perfectly fine to be orange. In fact, most of them are brightly colored, but that doesn't help you too much when it comes to stealth camping. So I hate to tell people to purchase tents based on their color. I mean, this is the exact opposite type of advice that we often give. We're like, go for specs, go for things. Don't worry about color. Color is irrelevant. If you are you don't pick the bike because it's a pretty color, you pick it because it's the size and shape and fit and need, everything that you need it to be. Well, if you're looking into doing more stealth camping, actually one of your early things to think about is color. So your mileage may vary. So those are your tools for all of this. Why? Why on earth would you ever want to do this type of thing? Maybe this is out of order. Maybe this is the type of thing that's at the the, the top of the list. Because for a lot of you, you may be like, I don't, I don't ever need to do this, man. The first thing I would say is that it's a good expense avoider. There are routes that I am looking at through different parts of the U.S. and, well, different parts of the U.S. because I, I don't think I would be as comfortable doing this in other countries personally unless it was part of that country's, um, I don't know, milieu. It's it's what, the, what they do, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the let's talk about not illegal section. But in any event, there are sections of routes that I've been looking at for rides this year where there is either no camping. Or it is really, really, in my opinion, overpriced. I find that I have an issue with paying the same amount or a similar amount as anybody who is car camping, as if my impact as a bicycle tourist with a tent is the same as somebody with a vehicle in a tent. And I get it, you know, I mean, I'm probably using the same number of resources, et cetera, et cetera, but I don't like spending more than, say, $10 to $12 for a night. Uh, I remember an old past guest on the show used to not want to pay anything for, quote unquote, sleeping on the ground. <laughs> That's how he put it. And, and I get that, too. I just I, I So in order to avoid the expense of a campsite that is frankly starting to get into the territory of hotel or cheap hotel stays, this is a good way to defray some expenses following this one guy on YouTube right now who is wild camping or hiker biker camping and he's going from like Florida to Alaska and this is this is a guy who's like sort of you know that fine line between uh un, undetermined trip and homeless you know like this dude's this dude's doing undetermined trip and he is he's a uh, watching every penny. And this is definitely one of the things in his arsenal to keep those costs down. So an expense avoider, it allows you to do more. Hey, if I don't have to spend 30 bucks on a campsite, well, that's 30 more bucks that I can spend on maybe treating myself to some better food. I mean, that's my fuel, man. <laughs> I'd rather spend it on food than on shelter if it makes sense. Second thing is adventure. Let's be honest. Stealth camping, there's a little element of, I don't know, not, maybe not danger, but certainly adventure. You are in a place that you are either not supposed to be, or it's not considered the type of place where one should camp. So there's, I have to be honest, it's kind of exciting. There's a sense of adventure around it. And the third reason why you might want to consider doing a stealth camp is something I haven't seen around, but it occurs to me is a really, really important reason why some people may consider stealth camping is it's an agenda enhancer. What do I mean by that? Well, because you're going until basically sunset and you're getting up at sunrise and you're going, it's very likely that you're going to be doing more miles or you're able to extend 
uh, and do more things because your days are going to be a little bit longer. Now, are you going to be maybe a little bit more tired? Yeah, maybe. But you're also going to bed a lot earlier, or at least you're making camp a lot earlier. So I think it's something that makes your riding a little bit more efficient because the only thing you're doing is you're going there to sleep and then you're getting out of there first thing crack of dawn in the morning. So I think it helps you get ahead on your tour. Let's talk a little bit about what makes for a good spot and what makes for a bad spot for stealth camping. So a good spot tends to be something, and we talked about this earlier, you're trying to be easy in and easy out, and you're trying to not be visible from the road or from structures or anything else nearby. A great idea is to be elevated above the road. So if you are looking around and you've got a choice where you can be down from the road or up from the road, choose up. Now you are going to want a flat spot unless you can figure out a way on a hill to hang a hammock so that you're level. But trust me, camping on unlevel ground, even just slightly unlevel ground, is a super huge drag. So when I talk about going up, you're going up to hopefully find some flat spots or you're going up to find two trees where you can hang your hammock in a way that is that is flat. Um, that gives you a little bit more flexibility. Hammock folks uh, or folks that carry extra hammocks, if if the weather is right if you, if you or if you've got a hammock with a fly, you're going to be in a little bit better shape. You've got better opportunities in wooded areas because you don't have to worry about level ground at all. But going above the road is always better. Why? Eh, people tend to look down rather than up when they're traveling along. So elevated is the way to go. Second thing about a good spot is it's going to be behind something. It's going to be behind a big rock. It's going to be behind brush or trees or the topography of the land is going to block a little bit. You're going to go behind a little bit of a hill, a little bit of a rise. That's all going to be really good. But be sure to look around you as well because you might not be visible from one angle, but you could be super visible from another. So just be mindful of that behind the thing. Be behind things. And another uh, example of a good spot is going to be someplace that's on public land because in many places, public land, it's totally and 100% legal for you to do it. Forest service land is a great example. We've talked about dispersed camping before. You, You don't even have to worry about, oh, am I doing something wrong here? That's actually on federal land in the United States. It's dispersed camping. It's no problem. Uh, other countries where you're at, a lot of a lot of times public land, perfectly fine for you to just pitch a tent. If it's not posted with no camping, no trespassing signs, that's ideal. So some place that is on a somewhat public space that's not posted, that is pretty much considered fair game, at least in my philosophy of all this. Let's talk about this and contrast what we just talked about with some bad spots. A bad spot is any place that's off of a highly used trail and you may think to yourself, wait a second, you know, what if we're on a trail like the CNO? Well, the CNO is a bad example because you have campsites every five to 10 miles. Let's talk about the gap where there's gaps, ha, huh, in between large sections. The Ohio to Erie Trail, gaps between sections. Why not just, you know, camp on the side of the trail there? What, what's the big deal? Well, a lot of folks in the local area walk their dogs at the crack of dawn, sometimes even before dawn. And if you're not supposed to be there and they're walking their dogs nearby, eh, it's kind of a bad look. Um, Hiking trails, walking trails, things like that. You know, here in D.C., we've got Rock Creek Park, which is this enormous wooded area, which would be amazing for camping. But it's got a ton of walking trails. And frankly, people use them at all hours of the day and especially right at dusk and right at dawn because folks are walking their dogs. And trust me, dogs are going to find you. (laughs) They will find you, especially if you're cooking. So, you know, being by trails like that, especially right off of them, not a great idea, not a good spot for it. It's very likely you'll end up encountering folks. And that's against one of our not rules, but our goals, right? Um, one other thing, or t- I'm sorry, two other things that I would consider are bad spots. Anytime you're on a farm, the, a lot of folks are tempted to say, oh, well, this is just a farm. It's cool. I can just camp on somebody's farm. Well, you know, it is somebody's property, but also lots of farms have farm dogs. And I'll tell you what, farm dogs will smell you from a million miles away and they will come and find you. They'll narc you out. I'm just here to tell you. So I, I just don't think that farms are a very good spot. Uh, Sometimes people will quibble with that, but I I just, I'm not a big fan of plunking down on somebody's farm. 
The last example of a bad spot, any place that's posted is no trespassing. Now, that's for me. I If I see an explicit desire by the landowner that you not be there, then I'm going to honor that. There are lots of folks out there that say, because I'm going to leave no trace and because this land isn't being used at this time and et cetera, et cetera, they have no problem with that. I won't quibble with your your point of view on that. Lots of people do, but I do not personally go any place that's posted as no trespassing. Let's talk a little bit about that because now we're getting into the whole illegality aspect, the trespassing element. And remember back at the beginning, I talked about try to keep this not illegal. And I find a distinction here, and that is, in let me take a global view because I've been very U.S. centric here for our international listeners. In some countries, you you're listening right now, going, "What the heck's going on in the U.S.?" For a variety of reasons, I'm sure. But for this issue, people have the open right to wild camp in all sorts of different countries. A couple of Scandinavian countries uh, offhand, I believe Sweden has a very specific rule that allows you to just camp anywhere you want, which is pretty amazing. I think maybe I'm mistaken. It's Norway. Folks in Scandinavian countries, correct me on this one. Yay for that. I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, It follows all the rules that we talked about before, uh, leave no trace, et cetera, et cetera. In the U.S. and in Canada and in many other places, it's a lot fuzzier when you're in places that are not specifically posted, but they're either private land or maybe land owned by, I don't know, local governments or whatever, where there's a property owner almost everywhere you go. But real talk here. You're probably trespassing if you're on someone else's or some entity's land. Even if it doesn't say no trespassing, you're probably trespassing because you're there without permission. So I'm not telling you to trespass is basically what I'm here to tell you. But I think that there's a distinction between actively stating do not trespass and having open space there that you're going to honor and be cool with, you're going to be there for a very short period of time, and you're going to be on your way, leaving no trace. I think there is a distinction there. That's why I call that element not illegal. <laughs> it's it, Those of you who are lawyers out in the audience are already having mass field days <laughs> with my distinctions here. I can, I can destroy my arguments myself. But uh, for purposes of the non-legal crowd here, Let's use the term not illegal here. Some places are posted with no trespassing signs. My point of view, I never wild camp there. I never stealth camp there. I suggest you avoid those. Some places are obviously residential. I avoid those. You should avoid those as well. If Camping in somebody's yard without their permission, dude, just knock on the door. <laughs> you know, I mean, that that's what you should do. You should ask for permission in that sense. And if you get permission, then great. Awesome. I know lots of people who who have stayed many nights in yards all around the U.S. Uh, in particular, since we're being kind of U.S. centric here, and that that just works great. Don't stay in somebody's yard without asking for permission. I just I just don't think that that's cool, especially if there's a residence that's there. I mean that just that just doesn't strike me as a great idea. Um, some places are not public land, but it's not posted. Some of those spots are places to consider if and only if you can be in and out with no impact. And I can think of tons of examples of those types of lands, but it's sort of, you see it, you know, you're you're going along the road there. It's obviously not a farm. It's obviously not a park. It's just this open piece of land. And it's not really clear whether it's owned by anyone. It's not part of a residence, but it's this big wooded area. That is the kind of place that, so long as there's no posted, no trespassing signs, that's kind of this gray area where I think stealth camping is a pretty decent idea. It could be old right-of-ways. It could be all sorts of things. There are so many examples on YouTube of people doing it right and people doing it wrong. Uh, Stealth camping, I'm talking about. I saw one example of a guy who just decided that it was cool for him to go to this firehouse. And he said there was nobody there. And he finds a shed in the back and he decides to just set up his tent in there. No, didn't ask for permission, didn't ask for nothing. And then he was really pissed off when the cops came (laughs) and and told him he couldn't do that and that it was illegal. And then he got really pissy about it. Yeah, I'm going to argue that that was the wrong way to approach things. I think there are way better places to go for wild camping and stealth camping. And that was, I think, crossing a little bit too many lines, in my opinion. 
everybody has different different lines that they're willing to cross for all of this. To me, that's the wrong way to do it. Let me give you an example of a few things that I think are a reasonable, good place. Some of these are places that I've done myself. Example number one, behind a billboard off the side of a road. That was a situation, I'll, 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 that's an example that I've actually already been on record doing before, a um, few years ago. And the billboard, the land around the billboard is presumably, it's presumably privately owned, but there was no no trespassing sign anywhere around them. And when I went in off of the area there, there were no no trespassing signs into the trees where I went. I hung my hammock there. I probably stayed there about three or four hours because <laughs> I couldn't sleep because I was so excited about my ride. <laughs> so that was a terrible night of sleep. But it was a great example of getting in after dark, hanging my hammock, attempting to sleep, and then getting out before sunrise. That was, to me, a quintessentially good example of a not illegal kind of hanging my hammock, stealth camping, and continuing my ride. Example number two, abandoned roads. I have seen a few examples on YouTube of maybe not roads so much, but abandoned right-of-ways and other uh, places where there were steps in this one video that I saw of this one guy who was going through, actually he was in Cincinnati of all places, and he was he, he locked his bike up down at the side of the highway there, and there was this weird set of stairs up that went down to the highway, clearly had been overgrown, hadn't been used in, in a while, but then he gets to the top of those stairs, and it's this old road of some type that is overgrown and weedy and hadn't been used. Maybe it was an old rail bed, maybe it was something else, but that was a great place for a stealth camp. Was it owned by someone? Presumably, yeah, but there were no no trespassing signs, nothing like that. It was a great spot. It was elevated above the road. It was everything that was perfect about uh, stealth camping and followed the rules in a really good way. So abandoned roads, abandoned right-of-ways, things along those lines, really excellent example. Another example, picnic shelters at rest stops. And I put it in parentheses, maybe, because there may be signs that say, you can't camp here. There's no camping allowed here. There's no this, there's no that. And there's tons of examples of rest stops where you're just not allowed to pitch a tent. But I also know that there's lots of examples in parks and in rest stops and other places where I know a lot of people who just sleep on picnic benches. I've had uh, Michael Risica I've had on the show. That He's the king of that, man. That's what he does when he, when he goes bike touring. Um, and he doesn't ask for permission. Um, he may be staying in places where it's not technically allowed, but that's, that's what stealth camping is all about. He's in, he's out, he's gone and he's gone early. So that's an example of something. And it, that again gets to what are your lines? Where are you going to draw the line? If it says you can't do it, are you going to 100% follow that rule every time? Or are you going to say, look, you're trying to stop something that I'm not doing. And so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Beg for forgiveness instead of asking for permission, I think is how the phrase goes. So that's up to you. I do not give you, nor can I give you, permission to trespass. I think I've been pretty clear on that. I know many people who are comfortable stealth camping in spots that are posted but are otherwise public spaces. I talked about, I know Michael's probably one of those examples, but he may, he may have different rules. I don't want to speak for him. Um, folks who are cool on private land where the impact of their overnight is minimal. So let's say they stay on the edges of farms. I've seen this on YouTube. I've known people who do this. Where your line is may vary, but know that when you do this, it's very likely that you are trespassing. That can be a serious problem for you. That could be no problem for you. I'm just here to tell you that's probably what it is. If you're on somebody's land without permission, without license, as we call it in the law, you're trespassing. So there could be consequences to that. Let's talk about one of them. So what if you get caught? <laughs> I've never been caught. Um, I've known people who have been caught. This is what I would do. And this is, I think, um, the wisdom of folks who have talked about this in a variety of different forms all around the internets. The first thing I would say is be aware of your safety in the context of who's confronting you. If you are trespassing and there's a landowner who is confronting you, you may be in a place where they may have a firearm and they may have the right to use the firearm if they feel like their safety is threatened. So be mindful of that. Um, you know, I, I, 
I, that is why I am really mindful of not staying any place where there are no trespassing signs. I just don't think it's worth the risk. And um, also, I just don't think it's right for me personally. But be mindful of the fact that somebody with somebody could perceive you as a threat, even though you are the most pacifist, least <laughs> least threatening person in the world. Um, be mindful in that moment of how you are coming across to that person. I just throw that out there. Another thing, don't lie. Tell them exactly why you're there, what you're doing, and what your intentions were. I think that that is a much better sense of um, defraying any kind of anger or confrontation or something like that. Hey, uh, I'm bicycling across the country, across the state for another couple of days. I'm only staying, I, I got tired. I'm only staying here overnight. And then I was going to go. That's, I think that that's important. Don't, don't make up. Some, oh, I was feeling so sick and I, I just couldn't go any further unless it's true. Just don't make up stuff because just don't lie. Don't be a jerk. Don't throw back the confrontation back at that person, whether it's law enforcement or a landowner. That's not going to get you any place. Trust me. Um, it, it, it's it's going to work against you in every single way, shape, and form. So don't be a jerk. You're, you're in probably in the wrong and you're being confronted about it. So don't throw that. Don't mirror that back at the folks that are confronting you. What I've, I've run across folks who have come into this scenario. Again, I've never been caught. I've never had an issue. I think this is a good policy. Ask to stay, but offer to leave. And that could suck. <laughs> you know, offering to leave is is kind of a thing where it's like, uh, you know, it's going to be late at night. Where are you going to go? Maybe you don't have lights, whatever. But I think that if you say, look, I would, it, it, could, could I just stay until sunrise? I will be gone. But if that's not cool by you, I, 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 I can absolutely go. I don't know where I'm going to go, um, but I, I, I will go if that's what you want. Um, I think that that puts the onus on them to say, okay, what's reasonable in, under the circumstances? If it's the landowner, well, then they're giving you permission all of a sudden if they say yes. If it's law enforcement, they may not be able to give you that permission uh, depending on where it's at because it could be private land. Uh, but anyways, it, I think it's worth throwing out there uh, because that is, I think, the most likely way for you to get success before you move on. So anyways, that's what I would recommend if you get caught. Frankly, if you do things right, you're not going to get caught. And most people don't get caught. And I think that that is one of the lessons that you learn as you do stealth camping over time is that if you get good at finding a good spot, and you're not a jerk, and you leave no trace, and you don't do anything that's really like, hey, look at me in my orange tent, and hey, I'm just going to have a huge campfire here, and and treat this space as if it were my own personal you know, national park. You know, if you don't do those things, you come late, you leave early, it's really unlikely that this is going to be a, be a problem. No one's going to be the wiser, and this will end up benefiting you in the long run. So, to wrap it all up, I don't stealth camp often. I generally don't have to. When I do, I tread very lightly. I leave no trace. I get in and I get out quickly. And I respect the places that are explicitly forbidden for me to be at. There are other points of views on stealth camping. I think I've said that throughout this entire episode here. I'm fine with what you choose to do unless you ignore the leave no trace principles. That makes you a jerk. <laughs> but be mindful that in almost every single instance, there's probably some element of trespass and what you're willing to do is what you're willing to do. And you draw your own line. Just wanted to make sure that you knew all of that before you went out and started dabbling in a little bit of stealth camping. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community expanding into live shows, meetups, and tour journals, including the brand new Tour Journals Plus feed coming for the DC to Cincinnati ride. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot in annual options if you're not into the small monthly thing. Check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. 
onto the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lane, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Didis, Thomas Skato, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgatis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Stuart Buckin, Todd Stutz, Mr. T, Roxy Arning, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Paul Culbertson, Scott Culbertson, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Richard Patch, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Dave Roll, Joseph Quinn, Susan Brewster, Drew Porter, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robert, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Hankel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Aviles Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Dan Gebhardt, Jody Zuranen, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, and new to the society, Brian Bechtel and Reinhardt Biggle. And thanks to all past and anonymous members for helping to make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.